apartment hunter. This is one of the things. I did this myself. My father said he would not help me. Before looking for a place, search online or hire a consultant. When looking, go with a friend or family member, even though I did it myself. I went to one apartment that the person had a gall to show me. This was my first teaching job in St. Lucie County. And there was garbage on the floor. I could not believe that the person showed me this apartment. I calmly looked at it, said, thank you very much, have a good day, and never called them back again. Select an apartment you could afford. You don't need all the bells and whistles, what you can afford. Have someone read the contract for the apartment before you rent it. Because if you break a contract, you may be forced to pay the rest of the year. Make sure that it's in a safe neighborhood. Because at times people with autism are oblivious about this. I've walked into someone traveling some incredibly dangerous situations without knowing it. Budget your money so you could have, um, include utilities and cables and other things. You need to think about these things. It's not out of sight, out of mind. This is for anyone, even if you're not on the spectrum. The dating minefield. That was the original name of my book. And that's another thing. I would have done when I was younger. I made a compromise because I wanted my book published. They said, we don't want something obtuse like the dating mind field. So they said, decoding dating, OK. When I was in my 20s, I would have told them to fly a kite. But when you're older, you learn to shut your mouth. Try to meet someone that has sim similar interests and desires to you. Online social networks and dating sites allow you to get to know someone more slowly. Someone with autism, that's good. A matter of fact, even without autism, 25% of the people that are going out with people, according to different statistics, are meeting people online now. Be aware that some people on these sites are not honest or exaggerate. People have pictures that are 10 years old, or people say things that they're not. I had someone in my family that had someone tell her a whole bunch of lies about themselves. Nothing was true. Meet someone for a first date in a safe place like a restaurant or a bookstore. That's what I did when I was dating. Don't be too friendly or gracious on a first date. That's unsettling to people. You're not going to have a second date. That's for the people on the spectrum. I'm going to tell you that. Do not be overly ingratiating. Don't try to please a person with everything. Be yourself. Dress nicely. First impressions are important. Like, look at what I'm wearing tonight for my presentation. How would you feel if I came here wearing flip-flops, uh, Bermuda shorts, and a Hawaiian shirt? Some of you would say, okay. Does this person take it seriously? But uh, you know what? I've learned that I can't do those things, and I don't do those. Uh, don't do those things. I look at things very, very carefully. The only thing I could tell you I do because of comfort, and my wife would kill me, uh, kill me for saying this. I wear white socks with these, and my wife hates that. She tells me it's a fashion faux pas. I said I really don't care. Even though I adore my wife, my wife also said to me, you know what, you're really nerdy. I said, and you know what, you married me. <laughs> Beware, most people that are dating have no ulterior motives in going out with someone. Unfortunately, some people will pretend to be something they are not or want to take advantage. Think about the catfishing. They had a whole show on that on MTV. They had a football player that was drafted from Notre Dame that had someone catfish him for a year. Online, there are people who write what people want to hear and are looking at what they can get from you, whether it's emotionally or materially. This could happen to both sexes. A person could use you for money and or material goods, as I said. Other people use you in a variety of emotional ways. I was in a relationship where I was emotionally abused, my first relationship. And I did not know how to deal with it because it's not socially agile. Just because it's going out with someone didn't mean I had all the tools to deal with it at that time in my 20s. If it's too good to be true, it is. 
You need to look at how someone behaves and reacts towards you carefully. Autism spouse. Is there an ideal spouse for an individual with autism? I'm lucky my wife's not here now. Autism spouse. Someone who's understanding and accepting. My wife is pretty understanding. It's very important because you know what? We go by a different drummer. I'm not going to be like every, every guy. If I need some space. I need some space. I actually have a Darth Vader shirt with him with uh, Princess Leia that says, give me space. And I was thinking maybe to give my wife a visual key, sometimes I'll wear that shirt. I don't think she'll appreciate it. She hates Star Wars. Willing to give spouse some space at times. When I come home from work, my wife knows to have my daughter give me at least 10 to 15 minutes to settle down because I'm not going to be able to deal with it. I deal with a wide variety of things throughout a day and I need to just settle down, let my hair down, metaphorically speaking. To be laid back and flexible. It's very important because you know what? We're never going to be boring, we're going to be interesting, but laid back and flexible is very, very important enjoys intellectual com conversations and pursuits, especially for people that are educated, it's incredibly important. Because I could talk about a wide variety of things and my wife and I had common interests, have common interests. Won't push spouse into activities that are uncomfortable. They know, like say for example, if she wants to go see in the past, sex in the city. She didn't make me go and see that. The same thing. I didn't make my wife see Guardians of the Galaxy. My daughter came with me. When my wife found out what was in the movie, she wasn't happy. But my daughter is a fan for life of it now. Steps to make a relationship work. Don't sweat the small things. The small things, if you sweat them, they become bigger and bigger and bigger and they make a relationship dysfunctional. That you need to avoid being overly critical. If something's not the way you like exactly, get a grip. When I was younger, I would criticize certain things my father made. My father is a foodie and I, he'd ask me, what do you think of the meal? It's good, but, and I'd give him a New York Times review and he'd tell me, go and find myself another blank in restaurant. With my wife, there's things I like, things I don't like. I'll eat them for the most part, but my wife wants me to tell her because she doesn't want to lose, waste money on things. So my wife has found a way for me to express it without me thinking I'm hurting her feelings. Do you want to have this meal again? Yes or no? And she'll look whether I ate the meal or not. But if you don't like something someone's wearing, you don't have to say it. Example of this is, did anyone ever see the Twix commercial years ago where there was this a full-figured woman that was wearing Daisy Duke shorts and she asked her husband how did she look like in her shorts? and she sh he shoves a Twix bar in his mouth. I don't have to say everything that's on my mind. I've learned to shut my mouth because when, so what I've learned is just because someone says it's all right doesn't mean it's all right and you need to think about someone else's feelings, especially when you have autism. You don't have a crystal ball and if you do, it's very, 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 malfunctionable. And how not to assume. If you're not sure, ask. Like my wife will say, such and such is in the kitchen. I'll say where in the kitchen. My wife says to me, it's not just because of my autism. She says it's because I'm a male and males are impaired with that. We have no sense of place of things. And that you should not be too literal. If you're not, if you think something is serious that someone's saying or something's upsetting, ask for a clarification. There's been times that my wife has joked with me that I've not been sure, so I've asked. And that you need to relax. This means giving yourself some space 
and doing things that are not just your job and not just your strong interest because this could push you away from your family. Like for example, computers. I make sure my computer is away for a good part of the day when I'm home now because that really upset both my wife and daughter. And listen and communicate. What is the difference between listening and hearing? Which one do you pay attention with? Listening. I hear a cat meowing. Am I listening? Unless it's my cat, I really don't care. But if I'm listening, I'm paying attention, and I'm being proactive about it. My wife knows when I'm not listening. I'm shaking my head up and down like one of those toy dogs that people put in the back of their cars. Up and down, up and down. And communicate. If you have something to say, say it at the time. Don't wait for three weeks to blow up and have a fight about it. Talk about it. Be open about it. Speak freely about it. This is how relationships succeed. Lessons learned by an Audi daddy. These are things that I've learned. Do what interests both of you, not just you. When I was a child, my father had his two interests, were books and food. He only took me to one sporting event in my whole life, and I love sports. He told me after that one time, I'd rather have a root canal than do this, and I'm not doing this. My daughter, many times, and I really don't care that I'm saying this, has used me as a makeup dummy. I did look like the main character from Rocky Horror Picture Show, and when she was six, she put on Facebook, I didn't know that she was that technologically able. I told her, you better take it down. I don't need this. But you know what? It was about her, not about me. Was this something I wanted to do? Of course not. I do art with her. I do things that she likes, and we do things that both of us like. Both of us are foodies, but it's not always about me. She doesn't like sports, and I realize that. I'm not going to push her to watch sports. Be emotionally available to your child. With my father, his attitude was, I don't have to say I love you. You'll know it by my actions. You know what? That's full of it. People need affirmation. People want to know that they're loved. People want to know that they're doing right. Until I was 40, I was congratulated four times by my father. My father is the type of person, when my sister graduated from a Canadian equivalent of an Ivy League school, what are you going to do with your life next? Provide a, a verbal and emotional support to your child. Listen to what they have to say. If something bothers them, don't deny it because that's what you think it is. Because one of the things we tend to do on the spectrum is project our own feelings onto other people. That's what uh, contextual blindness is. We're looking at it from our point of view, wearing blinders. And give them your time. My father very rarely did that for me. If he was here, he may take exception, but that's what I feel. Normality is overrated and boring. That's what my dad said. Autism is only a name. The condition is what we live with. Live as you don't have autism, adapt as you do. That was inspired by my grandmother. My grandmother did not know I had autism, but knew about all my struggles. Meaning, you know what? The world really doesn't care. But I have to deal with my reality. I have to deal with my challenges. I have to be realistic with it. I thank you very much. Any questions you want, please feel free. Yes. Yeah, um, well, one of my questions is how um, a child in autism can learn to speak as a teenager. You need to change, like, say, for example, I had a student when I was teaching middle school years ago that even in a class with students with autism, it was 
way immature, which was that he liked Winnie the Pooh. People made fun of him. The first thing you need to do is change that over time. You can't do that overnight. It took me six months to get him off of that and to get him to a cartoon that was more age appropriate. It's steps. It's looking for things that are more socially appropriate for his age group and for, his, for, his, for the people he hangs around because it's different. If you're in a totally regular ed situation, it's totally different. There's certain things that I don't want my kids in my class doing that is age appropriate that I don't like, like uh, South Park or Family Guy, which I find objectionable. But there's other things age appropriate that I could show them, like certain things that I teach my kids not to do. If they say something in class that's inappropriate, I don't punish them. I use it as an educational opportunity. That these are things that you have to do over time. You have to find out what, the, what grade is he, he or she in. computer games yeah. but that's a little bit more of a problem what you need to do with computer games is until he does what he needs to do he can't go to the computer I don't care what it is and if he's not going to listen you have to take that computer yeah. away away you know what there's going to be meltdowns there's going to be arguments that in the real world you can't be with a computer. I had students that were playing computers at nights, unbeknownst to their parents. You know what I did? I let their parents know. The students at first were mad, but you know what? It wasn't about me telling on them. It was about me changing the situation for them so they could function better in the surroundings that they're in that they need to earn that time. You need to limit that time. You need to give alternatives. Instead of a game on computer, if you're doing a game at home, have a family night where you have a game night. Do other things. My daughter's computer is not in her room. My daughter's computer time is limited. My daughter has changed her computer time because of that. It depends upon the individual. I'd say at most during the week, an hour, and that's it. An hour? An hour. That's it. It depends upon the individual, but it depends upon the individual. You know what? You need to do the other things too, because one of the things that you do with TV, because a lot of people with autism, not everybody, don't have many friends when they're growing up. They use the computer and they use media as a substitute for people. You need to create opportunities, take them to things. Say if they want to play video games, find a video game playing club where they're with other people or a Lego club. They have Lego groups. They have other things that you could do. Take them to a museum. Take them to groups. Take them to social groups. They have social groups here through card. You have so many different things you could do. Instead of watching TV if they want to watch something, take them to a movie. Take them out to a restaurant. Take them to so many different things that I did not have the choice, but you know what? There's a happy medium for that. There's a happy medium, I agree with you. But you don't have to have all or nothing, but it has to be cut back. <coughs> because a child with autism will watch TV for six or seven hours a day if you allow them to. I did that when I was in college while doing my homework, so I could tell you that. The only two things I did in college when my friends weren't around was reading books, TV, or going to a gym and lifting weights. That was it. And it's not healthy. You have to have a healthy balance in your life. I hope that helped. Yes?
Yes. Yes. We could talk later. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And we try to limit it, we then land up dealing with aggression and aggressivity. How can we do one without turning into the other and making out of the But you know what, first of all, maybe if there is physical aggression, not just verbal aggression, that's something, in my opinion, okay, that the person needs counseling to deal with that, to find more appropriate ways with which to deal with it, the child, okay? But if you keep on giving in, if someone has meltdowns, they're, you're doing, the, I'm not saying in a negative way and I'm not being negative, a person's doing them a disservice. That I'm not saying to be as blunt as my father. My father, not, because of the profession that he was in, could do that. It was black and white, you are going to do that and that's it. If I misbehaved even slightly at a meal, at a restaurant, I was removed from the table, that was it. I was not given an opportunity. But there's a middle ground to that. There's flexibility to that. It's a matter of talking and dealing with the situation and letting them realize what the consequences are beyond the behavior of that. What could happen down the road? I met someone when I was at University of Florida that had a college degree that was on the spectrum that did not have a job, was playing video games, was being taken advantage by a place where he was living at. And it was a very sad situation that it's very difficult to prepare for the real world. I did not have my first real full-time job until I was in my 30s. There's a lot that you need to do. What you're seeing with me is the evolved me, okay? You're not seeing me when I was a child. You're not seeing me when I was in college. When I was in college, I would say whatever was on my mind, darn the consequences. Example of this, and this will be shocking to some people, I like politics. Father didn't vote in the first election when we came from Canada. He, he's American through birth. I told him a historical fact, which I shouldn't have said to someone that was from Eastern Europe, that was born in the 30s, that it was people like you that brought Hitler to power, which is a historical fact. But you don't say that to someone of Jewish background that's of Eastern European background that lost family in the Holocaust. And my father's face was contorting, and I continued. And he didn't punch you. He told me the next time I did that that he was going to kill me. Okay, so, but not that he would. He's very expressive with his anger, even more so than me. But the point is, I wasn't reading the signals, I wasn't doing any of these things. That I need, I was on a learning curve. I know when not to push things with my wife. I know now when my daughter is upset something, give her some space. I'm not going to say, how are you, dear? And my daughter, when you know, she's upset, if you do that, will blow up. That the, this is a learning curve. He needs to learn this. Everybody on the spectrum needs to learn these things. It takes time. And it, it could take months or even years for that. But it's better that it's done even gradually. Because I had a situation like what you were saying about, I had a young lady that lived in Boca that I told, told her, mother, that just remove the stuff. Then deal with it, you have to deal with it in a multi-pronged approach. Not just taking something away, but dealing with where the aggression is. Dealing with where the consequences are. We have consequences for every action. There's a reaction, whether it's positive or negative, for everything in this world. That, for me, I don't, I, I'm very shy. People won't believe it, me talking in front of you. Why do you think I do this? What's the consequence for me doing this? Why do I like doing this? What? 
to advocate for people and to educate, to make a difference for people, to get people to see something a different way. If you send me to a bar with my wife, with people I don't know, I'm like one of those cigar store statues at the side saying nothing. But this is important to me. In other situations, I force myself to talk. Because if I want to have friends, that's what I have to do. If I want to get along with people, if I don't want people to project who I am, I have to speak for myself. I hope that helped. Any other questions? It's all right, don't worry about it. We got lost on campus. <laughs> uh, when you said that parents, my son is four, he's autistic, handsome parents. So when do we let go? Over time, when you're talking about a young child, over time, okay, there's certain things, like say, for example, I likely think my daughter is on the spectrum very slightly. My, there's certain things that I would make my daughter do earlier, gradually do, have her do more and more. It takes time. At this stage, it's a matter of creating opportunities and showing them how to do things. Because the earlier you intervene, not just with professionals, but yourself, the more they're going to grow. And by the time they get to school, it's going to be easier, not harder, easier. And there's so much more now. When I was a child, it was also that my parents created opportunities. They took me places. They, ma they made me do things. They made me talk to people. They had me do things that I wouldn't normally do. But this is over time. When you're talking about a four-year-old, it's a whole different ballgame. But it's getting them to speak, getting them to say things about themselves getting them even to be a little social, but this is gradually done. Not going to do it overnight, because if you force it, they're going to go into their shell. It's a matter of knowing when to push, when to nudge, and when not to do so. An example of this is, it's sort of funny, and this is an adult and people laugh at this, I don't like big crowds. We had to go to my friend's 40th birthday party. We're in a small house with over 70 people. I'd rather be anywhere but there. My wife said to me if I could stay there two and a half hours, because in the past what happened with me, at another place, I had enough of it. I went in my uh, sister-in-law's bedroom, turned on the TV. My wife went Ricky Ricardo on me. The next day she realized, if I have stress, walk around for a few minutes and go back inside. Give yourself a breather. So what happened with this, we had a deal. So it was like a tangible reward for me. If I stayed there for two and a half hours, we'd go to Big Bear Brewery and I'd get a creme brulee. Guess what, what I did? I stayed there for two and a half hours. It's a matter of dealing with it and for your spouse or your parents having sympathy for the situation, not forcing them by giving them the tools with which to do it. Because for someone on the spectrum, sensory could be physically painful. If I'm in a crowded, claustrophobic place, it's like pins and needles attacking my body. But I've learned to deal with it. I've learned to advocate for myself. When I went to Norway, I took a plane from uh, Copenhagen. I didn't know how to speak Norwegian. I found someone that could speak English and got directions and did what I needed to do. Because you know what? I wanted adventure. I don't want to limit myself. Yes. Oh, you have to model it with him. Starting at home, if he wants something, have him ask you. Because a lot of times when you're a parent, you know what your child wants. Make him ask. 
If he wants something at a store, instead of you asking for it, ha when he wants to know where something is, have him ask for it. Because the more he does it, he's going to extend his comfort zone and it's going to become so much easier. It takes time. He needs to have the opportunities. But you need to practice it and you, you need to show him that nothing's going to happen to him by asking for these things. That it's all right. That it will work. But the more practice, the easier it gets. That I go all over the world. That I had a situation when I was in Paris. And it's an irony, my grandmother's born in Paris. I speak barely any French. I was on the wrong uh, subway to the wrong airport. And what I did is, I asked someone, my French was horrible, but he understood, he, it was nice. And this is something like people stereotypes about French not being nice to tourists. I made the attempt. He told me, you're on the wrong subway, you need to go on this one, and that's what I did. Another time when I was in London, when I was trying to find something, someone told me, please get out of this neighborhood. This neighborhood is not a safe neighborhood. And I listened to him. Or asking things and doing things and dealing with things as they come up. It's a matter of you teach him now by doing it at home first and going into a wider community, getting his teachers to do it at school it's going to become easier and easier over time. And what's going to happen over time, he's going to do it for himself. I had a young lady who's incredibly bright. And one of, uh, one of the people I worked with, the one that told me to quit acting so autistic, thought she wasn't so bright because she didn't talk very much. Let's have a stereotype about someone. I worked with her, got her to talk. I'm a pain in the butt. I'm going to nag and nag and nag, but in a positive way. The day before winter break, she did a double self-advocacy with me. She said, can I go upstairs? I need to find out about an assignment I have to do. So not only did she ask me, she went upstairs to get a clarification. That's what it's about, learning to do for yourself. I hope that helped. Any other questions? Yes. Okay, you know what? You know what you know what I'll say, excuse me for interrupting, you know what I'll say? People make stereotypes about things they don't know. Things that make people uncomfortable, people try to make an easy answer about it. That when you're, a lot of times people with autism can be caustic, cynical, sarcastic, but when it comes down to it, we look at people's people for the most part. If I see someone in a wheelchair, I don't say, is that person disabled? I don't care. When I was in third grade, I saw someone that was blind with a cane. I didn't want to, I didn't want to say, oh, he's blind, or ask him questions about blindness. I wanted to know how he used the cane. It was curiosity. I had friends with cerebral palsy. I had friends with different exceptionalities. I have, uh, my friends come from many different backgrounds, ethnically, everything. That's what I want. I want to, I want to find out as much about other people as I can. And we're saying normal. N what is normal? Okay, you know what, normal, there's, n at very best, normal is a subjective concept. At very worst, it doesn't exist. If you live as a child in a dysfunctional household, that's normal to you. When my grandmother was young, wearing pants was unacceptable on the street. And people have changed. When 40 years ago, 
someone that was a minority could not go to certain places. When my father was a child in Montreal being a Jew, there were certain places he could not live in, certain professions he could not have. Universities would make you get a higher grade. Things change. So whatever is normal, it changes. What I'm looking for is, I'm not looking for normality. What I'm looking for is people to expand how we look at the world, to look at the world in a more expansive, accepting, embracing way, to look at people's people. I'm not going to, I don't, I'm joking when I call you neurotypical. I don't call people that are, quote, not autistic, neurotypical. You're people. And that's it. That's what we are. I'm someone that happens to be autistic. I feel very strongly about this, but I'm not going to be someone that's saying, you know what, it's all wonderful. Because you have some people that are younger with autism that look at something like neurodiversity. I agree with neurodiversity, but I'm not going to look at something as an ideology. It's part of me. That we have to accept what our strengths are. We have to accept what our challenges are. I'm never going to be the life of the party. I know that. I'm shy. I know that. That I could at times be very critical. I know that. But the thing, but the thing is that it's amplified. The thing is, why I'm writing the book "Autism and the Myth of Normality." When someone looks at me or someone else in this room with autism, it's amplified. It's stereotyped. If I'm really into something, I'm obsessed. I've had people say, "Oh, you know what? You're obsessed with autism." I'm not obsessed with autism. This is my raison d'être. I want people not to face what I face. I don't want someone having to get their first real job in their early 30s, and that's what's happening right now. Right now, the unemployment and underemployment, underemployment means having a part-time job, according to different surveys, is between 80 to 90 percent for people with autism. I want that reality to change, and I'm going to fight for it. So if someone wants to call that an obsession with me, so be it. It's not an obsession. It's what I want. It's what's my interest. If I see younger people here, I don't want them to face the prejudice that I face. I want them to the, uh, have the opportunities that I did not have. I want them to be accepted in society. I'm not saying to accept everything, because you know what? For everybody, there's things that we should not accept. If I'm a jerk to my daughter or wife, there are consequences. It may be because of something to do with my autism at a time, but I have to take personal responsibility for myself. This is what I'm saying. I want to be a role model for them. I want, I want to be the person that's going to fight to make it easier for the people that have come after me. That's what this is about. This is why I do this. When I went to Denmark, I was only supposed to go to Denmark, okay? I met someone through Yale when I spoke at Yale. I could have taken the easy way out and gone to Copenhagen for a day before I went back to the United States. I'm a foodie. That would have been heaven for me. I contact him. How would you like me to speak at your university in Oslo for a day? I left after my presentation got there at 10 o'clock at night spoke with someone that was not on the spectrum endlessly about autism till 1.30 at night, got to speaking at 9 o'clock in the morning, so very little sleep, and did five presentations, then went to something the night, that night with people that were well known in the field there, then the next morning left to go back to the United States and teach the next day. That's what it's about for me. It's about making a difference. It's about giving parents the tools. It's a matter of getting people to get the strategies, getting people with autism to be empowered, getting people to look at us in a different way. I'm sorry that I'm very strident about it. This is what I feel. I hope I helped with that answer. Thank you.
want to feel him to help him more. But what you need to do is know when to talk to him and when not to talk to him. If someone's really upset, especially with autism, give them their space. What I hate is, I had some teachers saying, are you all right in putting their hand on the shoulder about someone that's about to blow? Give them their space. When he's ready to talk, talk about things, but talk about it in an informal way. Don't do it like picking a subject. Talk about it and let things flow. If he's going to feel more comfortable if you let it flow and talk about it. Like with the pills, ask him why it's bothering him. Because you know what? Sometimes pills could make people feel off. That I know, I'm going to be very honest, I've said this everywhere so it doesn't matter. I take something from my anxiety. If I don't, my mind goes a million miles a second. If I don't, I'm like Sheldon, but worse. When you said your mind's going to feel it. My mind can't stop. What, what, you're thinking I'm thinking about so many things at once. Think about a file cabinet and you take everything in a file cabinet and throw it out. And it's all over the floor. It's not organized. Everything. When I was a kid, there were days that my ADD from this autism that were so bad that I could not sit and do work. That the, these are things that not everybody with autism deals with, but a lot of people do. That's why my father had to drop out of school when he was younger and went to college later when he developed the, the skills to cope with it. These are things that people deal with. So the pill takes the edge off. You know what I would liken it to? For you neurotypicals, I'm sorry. Sometimes people have a drink after work. That's what it's like for me. It's for the whole day. Because if I don't do that, I'm short with my daughter. I could be incredibly sarcastic. I could say things that I should not say. There's a lot of disinhibition when I don't take my pill. I hope that helped. So it's a matter of talking freely and doing it naturally and letting them talk, asking them things and let it go freely and, and tell him you could talk to, you'll talk to him no matter what. My father, even though he's a pain in the butt, will talk to me about no matter what. He helped me come to terms with dealing with my autism. He's the one that's inspiring me to write this book that I'm writing right now. Even though he's a pain, he's incredible. And part of the reason I'm here tonight and have what I have is because of him and my mother. That's what I would say. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you very much.